I hope you enjoyed the break. And as promised, we are returning with a panel. Um, I am going to turn this now over to Anna Wan to do the introductions. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is Lisa Muscatine. She's the writer and the co-owner of the Politics and Prose Bookstore in Washington, DC. Politics and Prose is a crucial part of the DC culture. It attracts famous speakers such as Bill Clinton and JK Rowling. So before her bookstore, she served in the Obama administration as director of speech writing and senior advisor to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. She was a senior advisor on Hillary Clinton's 2008 presidential campaign and assisted in her 2016 presidential campaign as well. During the Clinton administration, she served a myriad of roles, from presidential speechwriter to deputy assistant for the president. Before entering the political arena, she was a journalist at the Washington Post. Through her multiple fields of expertise and illustrious careers in journalism, politics, and running an independent bookstore, one aspect has held steady, the intersection of words and ideas. And to fully fuse these ideas, now she's on to a fourth career, becoming an author. She is currently working on a book about the group of women around Hillary Clinton who are known as Hillary Land. The book to be published by Penguin Press is entitled Hillary Land, and we very much look forward to seeing its completion and reading it. So hailing from, <laughs> from Berkeley, California, she received a BA in history from Harvard and was among the first class of women to be elected Rhodes Scholars. She and her husband currently reside in Bethesda, Maryland. They have three grown children and a beloved rescue dog named Kimmy. Let's welcome Lissa. Thank you. Also with us today is Susan Bailey, class of 1963, who is a world-renowned scholar on gender and public policy. She served as the executive director of the Wellesley Centers for Women and a professor on women's and gender studies and education at Wellesley College for 25 years. Before she joined Wellesley Centers, she held director positions at the Council of Chief State School Officers in DC, the Policy Research Office on Women's Education at Harvard University, and worked with the Connecticut State Department of Education, where she led state efforts to implement federal Title IX regulations. Susan has conducted research on a variety of issues related to the education of women and girls, and was the principal author of How Schools Shortchange Girls a report that nominated that prompted national public dialogue on gender issues on K-12 education. She is currently working on a memoir titled The Education of a Feminist. Bailey guided the Wellesley Centers for Women for 25 years from its original mission and the organizational structure to its current preeminence as the largest gender-focused research and action organization in the US. She's the recipient of numerous awards, including the Activist and Policy Award from the Women Educators of the American Educational Research Association, and has served as president of the board of the National Council for Research on Women. She began her career by teaching elementary and secondary school in Taiwan, Latin America, and the US, before returning to graduate school at University of Michigan and Johns Hopkins. Her very first job after graduating from Wellesley was teaching in Taipei, Taiwan, when it was not possible to travel to the mainland. As such, returning to Asia for the Beijing conference was very special for her, and she sees it as coming full circle. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I, I want to begin by echoing the gratitude that Anna expressed. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Um, uh, I'm beyond excited to hear your stories, and that actually um, brings me to something that I just want to let you know how we're going to proceed. Um, I do have a number of questions. I'll be moderating uh, the discussion, but just to let you know, my intention at least is to stay out of the way as much as possible, um, both to let both of you talk. Um, this is really the one panel we have devoted towards the conference itself. Right. So most of the programming we have is looking at specific issues that were reflect the platform. But this year, we're really talking about the conference and thinking about, in particular, why it was such not only an important but a radical moment um, for movements for equality in, in international affairs. Um, so I will both let the stories go, so to speak. Um, but I also want to make sure we go until noon today, at which point we break for lunch. And we do want to make sure that we have time for questions for you. So at some point, we'll be moving um, from our discussion into um, questions from the fellows. So 
Um, so I'm just going to get started. I I'm curious if you could give us some background about what your role was at the Beijing conference. Well, my role was very unofficial because I was at the um, NGO meetings. Um, you were, I, a sort of an aside, in 1975 when the first UN conference on women was held in Mexico City, I went because I just said this is, this is where I have to be. I had no idea how to sign up, how to do anything. Um, so I just got a plane ticket. Um, my parents agreed to take care of my daughter um, for a week. And I went to Mexico City and hung around. And it was much more informal. It was much smaller. Um, people saw me. One time, great memory um, of being on the edge of a room. And Bella Abzug, whom some of you may know, she was a, a member of the House of Representatives from New York, and she always wore a large hat, so you could see her everywhere, um, was leaving. And as she passed me, she said, here, I have to go deal with some business. Take my seat. So I realized who it was. But before I could say anything, she turned around and looked at me, and she said, I've seen you here all week hanging around. How did you get here? I wish I could talk to you. I think you just came on your own. Good luck to you. <laughs> Um, and since those meetings, I had hoped to go to each of the, um, every five years, then it was 10 years, um, but I wasn't able to. I was busy with working and I was bringing up um, my daughter on my own and she has relatively severe disabilities. So it was always a dream. Sometime I'm going to get to one of the world conferences again. And luckily for me, um, because of, in part because of the book How Schools Shortchange Girls, the Ford Foundation was interested. Their field offices were interested in learning more about the book and, and how we had approached the research. And I was, they wanted us to translate it in time for Beijing. And I was very uncertain about that because it was work done here in the U.S. It was questions relative um, and relevant for students and teachers in the United States. Might not be so relevant. They said, no, no, it's not exactly the questions or the data you found. It's starting with women's voices and girls' voices. And that methodology is what we're interested in. So we hired translators. We translated into French, um, Chinese, and Spanish, and had copies of the book sent to Beijing, which was another whole story. But we thought we were going to be able to house them in Florence House, feminist press um, setting. Um, she was going to have a little office bookstore there. Um, and so I arrived in Beijing. You had to go with a group. You were not allowed to go on your own. So I signed up with a group of community college women who were going and thought their tour looked pretty good. It would be 10 days, and it was one of the least expensive. And the Ford Foundation said, it's OK, Susan. We're going to pay for your travel. <laughs> and arrived in Beijing um, for the non-governmental conference, which was far away from downtown Beijing. And I think you have a yeah. very different story of <laughs> how you got there. Alyssa, how, how did you come to Beijing? So I, I was, uh, well, actually, just by, by way of giving you some context, I was uh, the chief speechwriter at that point to First Lady Hillary Clinton, but also a presidential speechwriter. Why was that? No First Lady had ever had a speechwriter, ever, in the history of the country. Um, some of you may know that Hillary, when she became First Lady, took on a major domestic policy role, health care reform. And presidential speechwriters don't like writing for First Ladies, and First Ladies don't typically give a lot of speeches. So it was determined that she needed her own speechwriter for health care reform. But giving a whole slot would have been a little too much. So um, they created a hybrid position that was literally half time for the president and half time for her. And I started in that position. And then after a couple of years, it became apparent that she really needed somebody full time. And I jumped at the chance. I much preferred writing for her than for him for reasons I can bore you with at another time. But um, so I was her speechwriter. And she was invited by the UN Secretary General to give the keynote address at this conference. And UN conferences really, at that point, appealed, especially conferences on women, to people like me and Susan who cared about women's issues. And the rest of the world didn't pay that much attention, really. 
But the idea of having Hillary Clinton come was going to bring more visibility to this conference. And so we were all excited. You know, this was going to be a huge stage for her. She had really turned her attention to foreign affairs and women's rights and human rights overseas after health care reform failed in 1994, after the Democrats got killed in the 1994 midterm elections, for which she accrued a lot of unfair blame, some fair, un some unfair. Um, and so she started really focusing on soft power social development overseas. And so Beijing was going to be the latest in a succession of foreign trips she had made where she was really excited about very vocally championing women's rights. Um, so we were all set. We were planning it. And then um, in a really kind of crazy, mysterious development, in June, the, the conference was in September of 1995. In June of 1995, the Chinese arrested a man named Harry Wu. Harry Wu was a Chinese-born American, uh, na now an American citizen. He had gone back into China through one of the northern provinces. The Chinese accused him of coming in as a spy and arrested him. This created an incredible furor at, at home in the States and overseas over whether Hillary should now go. Would it be condoning Chinese crackdown on you know, sort of phony sham arrests of people? Was it going to condone their position on human rights if she went? Or did she need to go to stand up for women? And this tension just grew and grew. And it created all sorts of strange bedfellows. Conservatives in Congress who never wanted her to go because they thought this was going to be a bunch of bra-burning, crazy feminists gathering in, in Beijing and also thought you know, it was going to be very pro-choice and pro-family planning and all sorts of issues they, they, they didn't like, had never wanted her to go. And this was an opportunity for them to really make the case. Harry Wu's wife did not want her to go because she felt this would be caving into the Chinese. So this weird game of chicken happened for the whole summer. And it was sort of like, who's going to blink first, the Chinese or, or us? And what was fascinating is that the Chinese government, and remember, China in 1995 was not China today. It was just emerging you know, from sort of ancient times, really. It was still, still very far behind the rest of the world. And this conference represented for China an opportunity to show its importance on the world stage. It was a legitimizing conference for them to host a UN gathering like this. So they really wanted it and kind of needed it for pr prestige. And then they almost blew it by arresting Harry Wu and maybe not getting Hillary Clinton, the keynote speaker, to come. And in the process of arresting Harry Wu, they then created much more attention to the conference than even they probably wanted. Anyway, I think they finally realized this is not a good situation for us. So they convicted Harry Wu about 10 or 11 days before the conference and deported him. And then Hillary had the green light. Now, while all of this consternation is going on, and by the way, a lot of people in the administration did not want her to go. You know, she was being blamed for health care reform. She was being blamed for the midterm elections. She was outspoken. She was highly visible. And there were people in the West Wing who were like, whoa, 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 she's radioactive. She's going to now go on the world stage. And now there's all this attention and spotlight her. What is this woman going to say? Is she going to create some next problem for us? And you know, we have budget negotiations coming up in Congress with Newt Gingrich. And we have you know, delicate Sino-American relations to worry about. So there was a lot of energy against her going. She, on the other hand, was never in doubt that she was going to go. And at one point, she said to us, I'm just going to fly commercial and go as a private citizen. <laughs> and we were like, uh, probably not. But, <laughs> you know. but anyway, so that's how I ended up going. And obviously, as you've already mentioned, you ended up, you were at very different conferences, yeah. right? So you are over an hour outside of Beijing. Right, with the NGOs. You have 30,000 delegates there. I was reading about 4,000 breakout sections, all of this. You're at the Intergovernmental Conference. It's a bit of a big question, but, but what was this like? What were each of you trying to achieve here? What was the focus? Well, 
I was very excited first, as, as Anna mentioned, to be able to go to mainland China. I mean, I had spent a year in, in Taipei and, and traveling all over Taiwan, but you, you could not get a visa. You could not go. The closest I got was knowing some people in the uh, Nationalist Chinese Air Force and with two other friends. They flew us over to Kinmin, Kumoi, one day when the Americans would be sending over propaganda, um, dropping it on mainland China, and then you had to be back the same day because that was then it was the mainland Chinese communist chance to send propaganda over. It was a very interesting Cold War, but not very freezing kind of, of situation. So I was excited about that. And I was also excited about the opportunity to see, I could, I could tell it was going to be way bigger than, than Mexico City, and who would be there, and who, who would I meet. And being at the NGO conference was wonderful, because it was chaotic. So you would go someplace and think you were going to a session, and it wouldn't be there. But somebody would know that maybe it was over here, and maybe you should go there. And there were these <laughs> little buses. Um, van sort of that that took us around and you just would hop in anyone that you could to get a seat to go to some other part and there were people women mostly there were men there but mostly women from all over the world and we just chattered away and met each other and they were connections that um, some of which I still have and that we use later in a couple of conferences that we had at the centers but I also had the role of somehow distributing these books because it turned out that when I arrived at uh, Florence House supposed feminist bookstore tent, it was there was a tent. There wasn't anything else. There were no shelves. Florence said, "Oh, get your books out of here. I don't even know where they are. You know, it's going to be weeks. You'll never be able to do it." But there were some Chinese students who were helping with the conference and guiding people around. And one of them said to me, "Don't worry. Don't worry." We will help. Meet us at the, come with us now. So we went all through a long place riding on a little motorcycle and came to a big storage place where there were boxes from all over the world. People had been sending every kind of, of material. When I came back, I shipped back all kinds of pamphlets and things from NGO groups everywhere. And we found our boxes and they said, okay, professor, no problem. Meet us here at eight o'clock. We take them around. We put them in different places. So every day for five days until all the copies were gone, we loaded them on the back of this little truck with one wheel in the front and two in the back and a couple of benches and a driver in the front. And we went all around the conference leaving piles of books, the Spanish pile, the <laughs> English pile, the Chinese pile and the French pile. And then they met me in the afternoon, and we went back and collected them all because they said, can't leave materials. Police are taking everything. Mm -hmm. So we brought them back, did it again in the morning. I got to see every part of the NGO conference. I got to meet all kinds of uh, women, students. Um, it was very exciting, and I was just trying to absorb as as much as I could. And it wasn't until I'd been back for a couple of months that I really could kind of integrate all the experiences that I had had. And I was also on a couple of panels, both of which I managed to make and both of which were in places that they weren't supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> so Susan, what you're, the description you're giving us here is something that feels very chaotic, very ad hoc, totally and chaotic. very much about kind of the random contingent associations that you made. Yes. What was your experience of the UN conference, the, the official one yeah, in well, Beijing? Pretty much the opposite, but I do want to say, because um, Susan is maybe being too modest, what it took for people to get to Y Row to attend that conference and the accommodations were inadequate for the number. The Chinese did everything possible to deter women from coming, to deter assembling, to deter comfort, to deter organization and to handicap this group of women who were coming on their own dime with all, you know, all that requiring the energy and wherewithal to get themselves there and get to Y Row. And I, I just want to say you can't overstate the difficulty that was posed and the determination and resilience that Susan and all the other 30,000 women who made it there showed in defiance, really, of a lot of suppressive tactics by the host government. So 
I just want to say that. Well, I, I would just add that nothing ever seemed to be where it was supposed to be. Yeah. <laughs> and many women did get very fed up. I know a few who left because first you were staying in this hotel and then no, no, you were here. First you had a roommate, then you didn't have a roommate. I mean, you really had to go with the flow. But when you did, <laughs> it was wonderful. Well, the networking opportunities yeah. were amazing. Yeah. So for me, you know, it was very different. And, um, you know, once we got the green light, I, mean, we be, I, I had started working on the speech in anticipation of going. I never stopped working on it. And I have to say for any aspiring speech writers here, if you want a model of a speech writing process, that Beijing speech that Hillary gave was it. Because we kept it very close at hand. We did not show it to people. We, it was basically me, her, her deputy chief of staff, and her chief of staff really trying to conceive of it and work on it. Why did we try to keep it so closely guarded? A, there, this was a hugely controversial thing now. She was a controversial figure. Um, and we also did not want it to get diluted and diminished because people were afraid on the outside of what she might say. So we kept it very close to the vest. and. Um, so what happened was she and the president were off in Wyoming on a vacation. Um, and then they were going to go to Hawaii. And her staff was going to meet her, meet them in Hawaii. And then we were going on to Beijing. So by the time we got to Hawaii, I had written the first draft of the speech, or not the first, probably four or five drafts. And we felt pretty good about it. And you know she really liked it. And, um, and then we had to show it to the president. Just make sure he, you know, doctrine of no surprises, he knows what she's going to say. And, you know, I don't know how many of you have ever heard Bill Clinton, but it's like, I think this is pretty good. You know, I like this. I like it. I think it's good. So that was good. Um, <laughs> and then we had to deal with, uh, you know, his press secretary, or the, I think Mike McCurry was still the State Department press secretary who became the White House press secretary and now is a very dear friend of mine. But he was lowballing this with the American press. Like, she's not going to make any news. You're not going to say anything interesting. Don't worry. You don't even need to go on the trip. You know, they were so nervous about what she was going to say. Um, and again, we, didn't, we showed it to virtually no one. Then we flew from Hawaii to Guam for a brief stop in Guam and then on to Beijing. On the plane, who do we show it to? Madeleine Albright, who was heading the delegation. And of course, we needed her, uh, you know, we wanted to make sure she thought it was OK. And one of the things I will say about uh, Secretary Albright is that I so admire, I mean, I love her as a human being, but I so admire is both the judiciousness with which she would read these speeches, but also the appreciation that it needed to be powerful. You know, she was not going to sit there and say, oh, no, you really shouldn't say that, or, oh, that's a little too strong. No. She was all for it. And that was a hugely important thing for us, to give us confidence to go forward with this speech. Um, so on the plane, everybody goes to sleep. If you're the speechwriter, you never sleep. You're the only one, you know, awake. You have the little light over your thing, and it's very depressing. But I finally finished the final draft of the speech, and I took it up to the first lady's cabin um, to show it to her, just to get the final sign off. And of course, she knew it inside out by then. So I hand it to her, and forgive me for being extremely corny, but this. 25 years later, I remember like it was yesterday, and I get kind of emotional talking about it because it had that much power at the moment. I handed her the speech, and she took it, and she didn't say anything for a moment. She just kind of looked at me. And then she said, I just want to push the envelope as far as I can on women's rights and human rights. And I, I just was so blown away when she said that. Here we had just come out of this incredibly tense, controversial summer over whether she should even go. And people are afraid of what she's going to say. And there's so much pressure on her. And she was willing to walk into that minefield (laughs) and be unequivocal and unwavering about women's rights and human rights. And I was, and again, forgive me for being corny, I was so proud to be an American. I was so proud that she was the first lady. I was so proud that we were going there on somewhat hostile turf to make this claim and to put down, um, you know, these these unambiguous statements about women's rights. And I'll just never forget that moment as long as as I live, honestly. Um, One funny thing that to follow up. So we get there, and she had to give another speech first, and um, so we go, and she's she's on this stage, and the 
I don't know, the platform was too high. It was kind of a weird setup. But anyway, so she goes to give the speech, and I was standing on the side of the stage with, with Milan Verveer, who's her deputy chief of staff, who had been very instrumental in working on the speech with me. And we were feeling really good about this speech. Like, it was just, it felt just powerful and direct, and it was saying what we wanted to say and what, what the first lady wanted to say, most importantly. And she starts speaking. And... This is in a room of, unlike at the NGO conference, 1,500 official delegates, I think it was, from 189 countries, you know, all these different people from all over the world, sitting there waiting for this keynote speech from this very controversial, very visible representative of the United States. And there's no reaction. Like the entire audience, they look like statues. They're just completely unemotional. There's like not, no, um, no emoting whatsoever. And Milan and I start panicking like, oh my God, we have totally misread the situation. Like we're gonna create an internet, we're gonna, we did something wrong here. This is gonna turn into an international incident. This is gonna be a disaster. And finally the speech went on for a while and we were both just, you know, very nervous. And then all of a sudden the place bursts into applause. And we looked at each other and we thought, my God, we are so dumb. They, they had to wait till there was enough of a pause that all the simultaneous translations in other languages could <laughs> arrive at a point where everybody could actually clap. Um, the Chinese authorities blacked out that speech in the hall and in the surrounding areas and in, I think in most of China. Um, and they were not at all happy with her. She never mentioned China by name though. But anyway, so that, that was my, my immediate experience of the speech itself. And, and, and you know, with, with, with that, I actually want to focus for a few moments on the speech, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I actually had, the, I, I, I went ahead and not just reread it, but I re-listened to it oh, wow. um, over the weekend, which is worth doing the listening because you hear the buildup to the, to the famous line, right? Yeah. And the buildup is Hillary Clinton naming all of these atrocities, all of these violence against women. And she names it, and it is powerful, and it is hard to listen to. But it then culminates in this famous line, yeah. human rights are women's rights, right. and women rights are human rights. And we are talking about this today. That, in some ways, is so obvious to us now. What, it, what is radical about this? Because you're, just, you're describing radical movements. You're describing movements that people are shutting down or diverting or not letting come in, that it's blacked out in the halls. What, what's... What's important about that? Well, first of all, no one ever in the history of humankind had ever said these things. No one. No one, no one, no one. Certainly not on a global stage. I mean, she was the first person to give voice to the challenges, the aspirations, the, you know, the, the unfairness and injustices experienced by women all over the world. Now, how could this white professional woman from the United States speak for women all over the world? That was a big challenge for the speech. How was she you know, entitled to speak for everybody she was speaking to and theoretically speaking for? And we worked very hard in this speech, and if you read it, read, read it to universalize very, you know, lots of experiences of women. And I think that was one of the reasons it had such incredible resonance for all kinds of women who were very different from her. But we were very conscious of that. And at the same time, she was the one with the platform and the megaphone and the, and the visibility. And she was willing to use it, um, you know, as Stacey is saying, to, to catalog what women experience around the world. In graphic, vivid detail, you have to appreciate how radical that was at the time, how courageous that was. It just did not happen. And for her, her especially as a white first world professional women to do that on behalf of women everywhere. It, 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 was, it was revolutionary. It changed the discussion. And we had no idea that that line was going to have the resonance and endurance that it has had. And by the way, I think the litany is even more important, and I'm glad you mentioned it. It's more important as a kind of documentation of what women were up against and how it needs to change. We didn't know that line. We didn't know the speech was going to have a, as big an impact. But I traveled with Hillary to a lot of countries all over the world when she was first lady, and again, years later, when she was secretary of state. Even years later, as secretary of state, women would come up to her in different countries holding copies of the speech and reciting that line. I mean, it became like a manifesto for women around the world. So it was 
it, it just, if you didn't live then, and you, and, and, and you obviously you didn't, <laughs> um, it's hard to kind of fully appreciate just how momentous this was at the time. I mean, it really, really was. And by the way, good news, because of all the Harry Wu controversy, so much attention was now focused on her and what she was gonna say that the speech got way more attention than it probably would have originally. But something that's coming up and, and uh, kind, of, kind of push on this a bit, and but both of you are saying, right, as on the, is this tension between, on the one hand, Hillary Clinton takes a stage and she articulates human rights are women's rights and human rights uh, are, are, are women's rights. At the same time, there is a tension between what is universal and then all of being surrounded by all of this difference, right? You described this at the NGO conference, mm -hmm. right? Having all of these different interests and understanding you know, you talked about wrestling with this, mm -hmm. right? How do you find that balance, either at the conference or even this is something ongoing today, right? The, the definition of universal human rights, universal women's rights, but also wanting to recognize these unique experiences and conceptions of rights. Well, I think my experience at the NGO meeting was we heard about Hillary's speech. There were all kinds of rumors everywhere, but we were not allowed to go in. We went, we, they took us in on buses for one of the opening ceremonies. And at that point, 40 mile ride, big highway closed off entirely. We, they speeded us right in there. What that meant was that people who lived in the area could not get into Beijing. They couldn't use the road. It was, um, and we saw sometimes people standing on the edges of the road and waving to us. They knew that we were coming from the NGO conference into, but for uh, any meetings of substance, any uh, speeches, it was, we just got to see the, the very elaborate and lovely opening ceremonies. But we heard that Hillary was going to come to the NGO meetings the next day. And we were so excited. Everyone was excited. No one was talking about anything except, you know, Hillary, Hillary coming, speaking, telling us about women's rights or human rights because we had, had her there. And what I found the most fascinating looking back on it, and even at the time, was how much we then began to talk with each other across nations, across languages as best we could about what, what those rights were. And in my experience, it was the women from African nations who had already begun talking about gender violence and making um, wonderful presentations in different uh, venues about violence and, and big banners to stop violence against women. And the two fit together very well because there were discussions about, well, you know, do you think X is a right or Y is a right? And some, some of my U.S. colleagues were talking about, well, there are civil rights, but, you know, should we use the word human with rights? And I was like, did you listen? <laughs> But, you know, it's, it was a broad range of, of difference, not just between women from various countries, but within countries. But it was, a, it really was a, a, a stimulating, motivating, I can't think of the right word right now, um, but everybody was just a buzz. It was what everyone was talking about. And I, we were talking earlier, and um, you'll hear her side of how hard it was to get Hillary there. My side was we heard that she was coming, we heard what time it would be, and women you know, from all over the NGO conference converged. The hall was very small. You could not get in. I arrived two hours, what I thought was two hours early, um, and then it was another at least hour or two before um, we, anything happened. It was pouring rain. There was mud everywhere. We could, they were trying to keep people out, even people from the NGO conference, and you'll hear how they tried to keep other people out. Um, but everyone was, was happy. We were just, we were waiting, and we were not leaving. And we stood there in the rain for hours, and she came, and we, they did have a loudspeaker so we could hear outside. Um, I managed to get into the building, but then at one point, man grabbed me and said, oh, 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 oh. And I couldn't figure out you know, why me. And then, as I said earlier to you, I think that they were looking at people that they thought might be Americans, and they wanted us out of the building. 
whatever. At that point, it didn't, it almost, it didn't matter. We were so excited. No one was really complaining about the mud or the rain. We were sharing umbrellas. It was very, very moving. I, I get emotional about it, too. It was really wonderful. And when you have that experience, it doesn't leave you. It, it sticks with you. No, just to get to this question of human rights and women's rights, um, again, it seems obvious now. Uh, and I, I think it's, you know, I, I, I get, I guess, frustrated a bit when we have to parse it so much. I remember that after this conference and after this line got a lot of attention, Hillary was on a call-in radio show. And some guy calls in and goes, well, wait a minute. Why did you say human rights or women's rights? Like, I don't get it. You know, I mean, aren't they separate? <laughs> and she goes, um, no. And he goes, well, what do you mean? I don't get it. And she goes, OK, like, you can vote. Women should be able to vote. You can own property. She goes, there, that, that's what women, you know, women's rights are not a separate siloed version of human rights. Human rights are human rights. They're rights that everybody has a, you know, has a right to. And so the fact that we even had to explain it um, tells you kind of where things were. And even now, you know, the idea that, it, well, I mean, women continue to be segmented and siloed and treated as second class citizens uh, in, in so many parts of the world, including here in different ways, right? And so um, I think the point was let's stop, you know, acting and speaking as though women have some different claim to achieving their own potential and to enjoying the, the opportunities and privileges that other people, namely men, get to enjoy. That, it was pretty simple, really. So I want to ask just one more question because I actually want to open it up all to you. But and so you, you go through Beijing, you leave Beijing. It might take you a couple months, as you said, to, to process what happened. Here's this platform. Here's this remarkable speech. What would you point out as being the effects are, right? Because it's, it's kind of ephemeral. It's, someone could say it's a speech or it's, it's not a binding platform. Is it significant? And if so, what, what was significant about it? Well, I'll just speak from the perspective of someone working in an NGO with other NGOs. There was, we didn't come out of the NGO conference with any plan of action. I mean, there was a plan of action in the official conference, et cetera, nothing. But what happened? at least in the US and I think in, and I know in many other countries, was that everyone came back so energized that we individually talked about it before we left. And when we got home, we said, we have to do whatever we individually or in our organizations can do. There isn't one set plan of action. But here in the Boston area, all the NGOs, spontaneously, somebody said, let's have a meeting contacted some friends, said contacted all the people you know, and we had these meetings that turned out, some of them to be quite large, some of them were at Simmons College. Um, we had a conference every year that we were reporting back to each other on what we were doing. At the centers, I decided that one of the things that we could do was up our international work, building on all of the connections, and because my interest, a specific interest, was in girls' education, I worked on a curriculum called Global Issues, Gender Issues, which took us um, several years to finish because nobody really wanted to fund it. What do you need a curriculum for? And does it meet the curriculum guidelines of the state and this sort of thing? Um, but we finally did get a little funding. We published it in-house at the centers. And it wasn't a big seller, and a lot of people didn't use it, but a lot of schools did. A few schools still are using it. It was used in junior highs, high school, and in um, a lot in community colleges because I had all the connections of the women that I had traveled with. So I think that beyond the things that I'm sure that we'll talk about, there was whole but of energy and movement and things going on that even today we may not necessarily, most people might not trace them back to Beijing, but anybody who was in Beijing or in Wairo would. They would know that that's where the energy and some of the new ways of thinking about it, particularly around some questions of gender violence. So. 
Yeah, I mean, I think there are two ways to assess these things. I'm actually going to a conference later this year with, with uh, the former first lady um, to do an assessment of what has worked, where the gaps are, and what still needs to be done 25 years after the Beijing conference. There was a platform for action, as Susan mentioned, um, and Stacy mentioned, which was really important. Uh, Hillary would never go into something just to give a speech. I mean, to her, that is just foolishness and silly and a waste of time, because as she would say, a speech is just a speech. If you don't have a platform for action and then you don't hold people accountable, governments, NGOs, and others, in really moving the ball forward, what's the point? And I used to have an argument with her because I actually do think there is value in the symbolic impact of something like a speech or of rhetoric in getting those things to happen. So we've had this kind of you know, fun philosophical debate for 25 years about <laughs> this. But um, so I think there were tangible things that gov governments made uh, decisions to do, made commitments, pledges, and then there were follow-up conferences um, and I know in the United States, we did a lot on domestic violence. We did a lot on micro lending and microfinance, um, things that our country still was way behind on that we needed to do. So there were those kinds of concrete mm -hmm. things that emerged. But I think maybe as important, well, those are obviously important, but uh, in, important in, in their own way was sort of what Susan was talking about, which is the sheer visible force of women coming together collectively and saying, enough. This is not right. We are half the world. The world cannot make progress. The world cannot flourish. The world cannot advance if we continue to be suffering from the sorts of injustices and inequities that we are. Enough, enough, enough. And to see the power of that happening in the way that it did, honestly, I think largely thanks to the visibility of our First Lady, which just drew so much more attention. And she became this voice, this, as I said earlier, unequivocal, unambiguous, unwavering voice. To know that somebody of her stature was gonna get up there and say those things and call governments to account and make people take stock of the lives of women everywhere, I think that gave confidence to movements around the world and um, you know, is probably at the root of a lot of movements today. Uh, you know, for everything from, um, you know, perhaps Me Too to um, all sorts of other things. I do think also there were, has been a backlash, uh, unfortunately. That always happens when women make progress. People start freaking out. It's like, oh, my God. Um, and so, you know, you, there's always these, and there certainly are countries where that backlash has been felt much more acutely than uh, in other places. And I think we felt some of it here in our politics, our political sphere. Um, but I think overall, you know, the energy, like Susan was saying, behind this, the galvanizing moment and, and the confidence that it inspired that women can assert their voices in ways they haven't was, was monumentally important.